Well, it certainly is a wonderful privilege to be back with you. And uh, I'm glad my voice is stronger than it was two months ago when I was supposed to be here because I could even hardly squeak. And uh, it's been a challenge to work through bronchitis, but God has been good. And Fred and I feel like we're on the amends. And uh, this is sort of the test run this morning to see how we do. And so I'm really glad that we could be with you. Um, God has been really good. And uh, this morning I've chosen to preach out of the book of James. And uh, James chapter 3. And when I was a young adult, I had just finished college. And I lived for a year in the northern part of Chicago, actually in North Chicago, in a town called Des Plaines. And during that time, we were in a ministry for service men and women. And I did that for one year. But on Sunday nights, uh, a number of us would jump in the car and we'd go down to Chicago. And we'd go to the very famous Moody Memorial Church. And at that time, Dr. Warren Wiersbe was a pastor. And he was preaching through the book of James. And he was extremely articulate. I'll never forget the messages which he gave. And he entitled the book of James, Marks of Maturity. The Marks of Maturity. And later on, he went and wrote a book, which is entitled, Be Mature. It's for Christians. And what he did is he took each chapter, and each chapter was a mark of maturity. So in chapter one, the mature person is patient in testing. And you read the words, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you go through various testings of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance, patience, and so forth. In chapter 2, he, he spoke about the fact that the mature person practices the truth. And if you go and take a look at chapter 2, it really gets into the hypocrisy of many people say, well, I am a Christian but they don't practice it in their life. And he says, a true Christians, their faith is going to be demonstrated by their deeds. This morning, we're going to look at chapter three, where the mature person, the mature Christian has power over the tongue. That's saying quite a bit, isn't it? In chapter four, the mature person is a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. And when you take a look at where do wars come, where does strife come, where does all this stuff come? It comes from those desires that are inside us and churning around and so forth. And then you have the fifth chapter, the mature person is prayerful in trouble. And it talks about the prayer of a righteous person, how powerful and effective it is. So that outline sticks in my mind. Now, something which is interesting is that you take a look at the book of James, it's so filled with practical wisdom. It's compared to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. If the New Testament has a book on wisdom, it's the book of James. But who is this writer by the name of James? And I want to take a moment on this this morning because I think this is important. When we take a look at James, there's different James in the New Testament and so forth, but this James happens to be the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Now think about that. They both had the same mother, Mary, but God the Father was the father of Jesus, and Joseph was the father of James. So who is this James? What happens with James is he grows up watching Jesus. Every word he speaks, he watches that. Every attitude he has, he watches that. Every action, he observes that. He takes a look at all the different emotions which Jesus has, which are exposed. And James has this ringside seat looking at the life of Jesus. But something which is interesting, in James's early life, he was not a believer. He didn't believe in Jesus Christ when he was a child. He didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, even as a young adult. In fact, we have this time where Jesus is speaking and he's told, your brothers and your mother are here. Jesus was getting a lot of flack. And, you know, that's not really that good for the family when one of the members of the family is, is sort of getting beat up a little bit. So 
they're thinking about the fact that maybe we need to take them away. And Jesus says, well, who are my brothers? Who is my family? He says, those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. They were getting negative attention. But something changed after Jesus' death and resurrection. James became a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And the other thing is that you go to 1 Corinthians 15, where Jesus goes and meets with all kinds of people after the resurrection. And he first of all, he goes and meets with Peter. Then he meets 12. And then he meets with 500 people at once. And then it says this. Then Jesus appeared to James. And then to the apostles. And Paul says, as to me, who was untimely born. James went on to be the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. He presided over what was known as the Jerusalem Council, and that might be something that you're familiar with, but the Jerusalem Council was, we have all these people, the Holy Spirit is working like we sang about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working in the lives of these people who are Gentiles and they're becoming believers. What do we do with them? And so the Jerusalem Council, they gathered all these people together. And they said, what happens with all this? And so Peter speaks. I think Paul may have spoken as well. And, and many others spoke. Well, James was the one who presided over that council. And after listening to everybody else, everybody, what James did at the very end, he summed it all up and he said, this is how the church of Jesus Christ is going to welcome and enfold Gentile believers in the church. So James was a very high-profile leader in the early church of Christ. And when we study the book of James, we notice the depth of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and comprehension of how to live a mature life, how to live a life without hypocrisy, how to live a life without deception. And that's tough for us as Christians. How to deal with things like trials, how to respond to trouble. And that's filled with just all kinds of practical wisdom, I'd encourage you to study it. But this morning, we're going to look at chapter 3. And we read these particular words. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large, they are driven by strong winds. They are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. A tongue also is a fire a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets, on course, uh, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this shouldn't be that way. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape uh, vine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Let's pray a minute, shall we? Our God in heaven, we thank you for your word, which is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces through the vision of soul and spirit of joint and marrow and discerns the very thoughts and intentions of our heart. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light upon our path. Your word is alive. It's living and it gives us direction in our life. We ask that we may have attentive hearts and open minds and desire to live for your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And so James begins and he says, not many of you should presume to be teachers. And you think about that and you say, say what? I thought teaching was a very noble profession. I thought it was something that we should really desire to be teachers. Why shouldn't we 
presumed to be teachers. And he says, you presume to be teachers. Every one of us stumbles in many ways. And he says, teachers are going to be judged with a greater amount of strictness. But then he says, our tongues, our words, have a tendency to give us away. He says, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect person, able to keep his whole body in check. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus speaks, and he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In verse 45, he says, good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. James tells us that the tongue is extremely powerful. We spoke with the children about the rudder. We spoke to children with the children about the, about the bit in the horse's mouth. That rudder, so small, but it can turn that whole ship wherever the pilot, wherever the captain wants to go. It's amazing. That small little rudder. And that bit, you put it in the horse's mouth and you can control this huge, big animal. And James says the same thing is true about the tongue. The tongue is a powerful thing. And if we learn to say the right thing at the right time, in the right way, it's more precious than gold. The tongue has the power to direct. Fran and I have some very good friends. Uh, they were part of our church. We, we were part of their wedding when they got married. And um, four years ago, yesterday, they lost their son to suicide. It was about a year after this happened and we were with them one day and I, I talked to the father and I just said, could you help me understand what was the most helpful thought, word, concept that anybody shared with you that is really giving you some help and some direction to go on living through this terrible experience? And without hesitation, he said, someone came to us. Actually, I think it was a pastor who said to us, you know something? Before your son was your child, he was God's child. And all those moments when you could not be with him, God was with him. And all those moments in which you couldn't protect him, God was protecting him. And when he began to sort through after a period of time, he says that was the most helpful thing because he was struggling with the fact that he was often called to work on Saturdays and he had to work long hours. He wasn't able to do some of the things he wanted to do with his son and he was living with regret and resentment. And he says that was so helpful to recognize that God is bigger than I am and God is vested in this and has a greater stake into it. A word, a concept, you know, spoken at the right time, in the right way, with the right heart, with the right receptive heart, made such a difference in his life. And a word, a comment, how powerful it can be changing through these parents. The second power that we have, he speaks about here, is not so helpful. It's the tongue has the power to destroy. Uh, what we say is not always helpful, and our words may be very disastrous. James says, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets on the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Ill-chosen words can be very destructive. We take a look and we read from time to time of a person who says the wrong thing and they're in a position of authority or whatever it is and all of a sudden they're called in and they're released from their work. And sometimes they go bound and they, they not only lose their job but they try to get another job in the same field and they find out that they have lost their career as well. Words can begin a quarrel 
They can separate intimate friends, and they can produce untold strife. Words can disrupt and destroy family relationships. Words can begin wars with nations. Words can have deadly consequences. I dislike election years. Maybe you're just like I am. I've always disliked election years. And I especially didn't like election years when I was a pastor. Because how do you mediate between people that have Two different opinions and looking at things two different ways. And you say the wrong thing and they jump on you immediately. But one of the things about election years is it seems like it's getting more volatile all the time. And candidates, they'll do anything that they can to destroy the other person. In Galatians 5, it says, if you keep on biting and, de and, dis and dis destroying one another, watch out or you'll be, uh, be destroyed by one another. If you keep on biting and devouring one another, watch out lest you be destroyed by one another. Our tongues have the power to destroy. It just takes a spark. We can visualize this, a little spark, which will set a whole forest in fire, a cigarette butt, a spark that comes from the exhaust, whatever it might be, and massive amounts, hundreds and thousands of acres can be destroyed as a result of that. The third power is the power to delight or refresh. James over here alludes to a tree. And you go out on a very hot, blustery, hot day. And you go under a shade tree. And what is it, 10 to 15 degrees cooler? I have a brother that lives in Florida, and I have another brother that lives in Texas. And from time to time, we'll call and I'll say, well, how are things about you right now? And what's happening over there? And a week or two ago, my one brother says, well, it's only 90 degrees in the shade. Yeah, in the shade, 90 degrees in the shade. The other thing he does, he talks about fresh water. And if you're thirsty and you're dehydrated and you're feeling low and you get a glass of cool, fresh water, it's able to quench your thirst. And so in the same way, James says, the tongue has the power to, to delight. You feel overwhelmed because of the responsibilities in life. It may be as a parent. You feel responsible for your children, and yet it seems like the children, it seems like they're at each other's necks. And, and whatever it is, you're, you're feeling down. Or you, got, you go to work, and your task is just daunting. It's, it's tedious. It's stressful. And someone comes and they've been watching and they say, you know something? You are really a good parent. You really care for your children. Isn't that refreshing? Or through all the stress of work, someone says, I know this is really tough. And we've had have someone do this task and you were the most fit person for doing it, and we just want you to know how much we appreciate what you're doing. That's encouraging, isn't it? And you know, we go through life, and we meet people all the time, and our words have the power to delight. Here's someone who picks up our garbage, and they're sweating all over the place. You say, thank you for everything you do. Or someone else who has to take your call, and there's some things that are just not working right. At the end, you say, even though it may not be resolved, you say, thank you for taking my call. The words of thank you are going to the clerk at the, at the cashier at the grocery store. Which we, we really hope that you have a good day. The idea of blessing people, encouraging people, being a blessing, we have the opportunity to use our tongues in a very powerful and life-giving way. So if our tongues, our words are going to have this incredible power, how do we gain control over it? That, I think, is one of the keys. How do we do it? And to gain control of our tongues, the first thing which we need to do is we need to gain control over our hearts. Because out of the abundance of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
And our tongues are too often just basically just articulate what's already in the heart. And so if we have hurt and bitterness and, and we have our hearts are filled with all kinds of anger and uh, resentment and filth, it's going to be reflected in what we say. On the other hand, if our hearts are filled with kindness and tenderness and gentleness and love and forgiveness and compassion and humility, this also will be reflected in what we say. A second principle is to align our hearts with the heart of God. Psalm 19 says, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. How do we do this? To place our tongues on pause. To think. To ask. To pray. God, what do you think about this? What is it that you'd like me to say? How should I say it? James 1 verse 19 says, you need to take your words seriously. My brethren, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, for a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. You know, God is more concerned that we are living a righteous life than whether or not we're getting the last word. He's more concerned that we live a righteous life than whether or not we get our way. God desires righteousness and holiness in our life. So how do we do this? You notice the fact that James says, take note of this. Pay attention to this. And he's just not saying for you and you and you and you. He's saying for every one of us. We're all in this together. Take note of us. Pay attention. We need to be, first of all, quick to listen. You know what happens when we are not quick to listen? Often we don't have all the facts. We don't have the information. We have no clue where the other person's coming from. We don't communicate care. We don't communicate understanding. We don't see the bigger picture. We don't see things the way God sees it. If we pause, and if we're slow and quick to listen, what happens, we can gain the bigger picture. The second thing he says, he says, you need to be slow to speak. If you blurt out the first thing that comes to your mind, you're probably going to think, hmm, why did I say that? The key is not what to say, but how to say it. And sometimes timing is the right thing. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 7, it says there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. Let's take for a moment a person who goes to the, the funeral home and they want to express some sympathy to the person who's just lost a loved one. And they come there and they're not really thinking so much. They're thinking about just, I'm going to be here. And they, they come to the person they say, I know exactly how you're feeling. And then they go and talk about when they lost someone. How would you feel if they said that to you? You might back up and say, hmm, they know exactly how I'm feeling? They know exactly what my relationship was with this person? They know about all the very special memories I've had with this person? They know exactly how I feel. And what happens is that person has just minimized your feelings and your hurt. Instead, a person comes and they are really feeling for the person. They say, you know, I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I want you to know something. I care. You see the difference? Or it could be something simple, you know, I have a memory of your loved one. I remember the time that my car broke down and I was on the side of the road. And they stopped. They wanted to make sure I was okay. And then they went and picked me up and they brought me to a place where I could get help. You see the difference? You see the difference, what happens? 
you gave them a memory that they didn't even know about, about their, their, their loved one. And it's something which they can hang on to and they can take with them. And so, be slow to speak. Third, be slow to become angry. Another reason to pause is, and align our hearts with God is because we need to guard our emotions. Many times, our emotions are, are filled with all kinds of self-centeredness. Um, and we just say things, and it's the first thing that comes to our mind, and we look foolish afterwards. We may tear into someone, and we may reap the consequences, or we can pause. We can be still and just know, you know, but God is, is bigger than all this. We can gather information. We can give thought to what should be said and how to say it and when we should say it. And we can check if our emotions are under control. Recently, I had the opportunity to put some of this to get, uh, in practice. About two years ago, we had a neighbor that moved across the street. And uh, she, in some ways, is sort of like the law to herself. And uh, if she wants to do things, um, she checks out all the codes and so forth. And, and if she can get by with it, she does it. And she began telling us that she was going to do something. And I have to be honest, I was really irritated because we're trying to sell our house right now. And I don't want our property values to go down. And, but that's my self-centered heart, you know. And so anyway, through the whole thing, I... I was reflecting on these verses and I thought, I'm just going to pause and I'm going to try to get myself, my heart right. And I know that if she's done all this research, if I begin saying things to her that don't make sense, she's going to catch me on it every time. And the other thing is that she's a very good observant about attitudes and I might get nailed for being hypocritical. The other thing is that I'm a Christian and I'm also a Christian pastor. I don't know exactly where she is in her relationship with the Lord. And I didn't want to hear this, ah, you Christians, or, and you're a Christian pastor. And I thought, and so I really began thinking about the fact that I don't know where she is with the Lord. So what I want to do is make sure that I don't hinder anything like that. And so as I'm praying and thinking about this for a couple of days, she comes across the street and she talks to Fran one day and just says, uh, hey, how's it going? And they begin talking about his Fran's cleaning out the weed and the flowers and stuff like that. And then they had this conversation. Fran comes in. She says, by the way, she's not going to do it. She changed her mind and some things changed. And I go, wow, I could have shot off my mouth and I could have caused all kinds of dis uh, trouble and disturbance. But God took care of it. Now, it doesn't always happen that particular way, but it's another lesson for me. Just be still. Get my heart right. Get my mind right. If I have self-centeredness, let's see if I can have some contentment. If I'm impatient, let's become more patient. If I don't have all the facts, what are the facts? And it made all the difference just in this particular case. I mentioned before Psalm 19, verse 4. I'd like to leave that verse and one other verse with you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And then from the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 6, let your always be gracious, season with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer every person. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father and God, we just really want to thank you this morning that you've given us the incredible gift of the tongue. And with it, we can communicate and we can build relationships. With it, we can bless people. We can encourage people. Help us to use our speech wisely. Help us to gain power over our tongues to say words which are fitly spoken to build others up, words of delight to lift others out of some of the doldrums of life. 
Help us to have words which are gracious and truthful, God-honoring, seasoned with salt, that be appropriate for the area. And may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'd like to just remind you um, that Doug is one of the missionaries we support. And um, he's also one of our kids, one of our big kids. Um, and it's good to have him visit for a while. And he will tell you about life at crew. Thanks, Mom. Yeah, I'll put it up there. Morning. Um, it's good to be home um, in more ways than one. We uh, love getting to visit Green Road Church. Um, most of you know this, but this is where I grew up. And this was my home church as a kid. And even yesterday, I was reminded of the impact of this church. Um, and today, as I see faces, um, Dave and Jan Jolersma were our youth group leaders. Dave Kuypers, there he is, um, led cadets when I was in it. And um, Chuck and Ellen Osterday were Sunday school teachers. Um, so I, I could go on and on. But um, we, are, we are super grateful for um, this church as it was my home growing up, um, where I learned how to um, understand God and the Bible um, for the first time. So, but um, in addition to that, the church has been a partner of ours in um, our mission work with Crew. So um, for those of you who are new here, we, my wife Renee, who's upstairs with our youngest, he's having a rough morning, and our two kids here in the front, Evie and Sophia, Caleb's up there with Renee. Um, we moved down to Orlando in 2016, and um, but prior to that, we were working on the campus of Indiana University with Crew, um, doing ministry to the two, uh, about 20,000 college students down there. Um, but in 2016, we moved to Orlando and began participating in a leadership development program there for 10 months. Um, for seasoned missionaries with crew. Um, and then we had the opportunity to take a leadership role with uh, that same program. And so now we get to serve the missionaries that are coming in from the field, uh, many of them coming from overseas locations, uh, others coming in from state, the, uh, all around the United States. We have the opportunity and the privilege to serve those staff. Um, so our, our mission is that the Lake Heart Stint Program, is what we call it, would, would help to fulfill the Great Commission by helping crew missionaries increase in faith, growth, and fruitfulness so that everyone would know someone who truly follows Jesus. Um, and one of the easiest ways I, I've described what we do is that we have the opportunity to minister to those who minister or to shepherd those who shepherd um, as the missionaries that are coming in um, for the 10-month program often come in a little bit beat up, a little bit ragged. Um, some have come from some hard places to do ministry. Others have come out of maybe some rough team situations, unfortunately. Um, or for us, like when we went down to participate in the program, we had just gone through a, a very challenging adoption loss. And we knew that we needed some space to process that loss, as well as an opportunity to uh, step away from the fast pace of campus ministry and kind of reflect on what God might be leading us to next. Though we thought that was to go back into the campus ministry, we ended up staying in Orlando and now have the opportunity to serve in what's referred to as leadership development and human resources. Um, and, and as I said earlier, that's caring for these missionaries with crew. So um, what that looks like kind of on a, a regular basis is we meet with our small groups um, every other week. And typically we have a group of six to eight missionaries. We have a, Renee and I have the opportunity to lead that group, pour into those missionaries, um, to, to look at God's word, to pray together, um, just to hear their stories to sit in grief and sorrow with them as they 
recount some of the losses they've experienced, but also to celebrate what God has done in and through them in their lives. And then um, we, also, we also give them an opportunity on a weekly basis to be developed through um, three hours of uh, what we call our development meeting and we pour into them that way. And then we give them individual coaching. So this year I had the, uh, the pleasure of coaching three men um, and just saw the Lord do a work in each one of their lives. Um, one couple, uh, Garrett and his wife Laura, were actually considering leaving ministry um, after a rough situation. And um, the Lord just gave them the, the space the environment, the community that they needed in these last 10 months, um, the opportunity to reflect on what they've been through, but also to think ahead and where they wanted to go. And so now Garrett is actually taking a leadership role um, on a campus in Texas, uh, in Austin, Texas, um, and has the opportunity to lead a team of crew staff there as they reach out to the, I think it's 30,000 plus students on that campus in Austin, Texas. Um, and that's the University of Texas, I should say. So what um, we have the opportunity to do, Renee and I have the opportunity to do is to pour into those folks, see them refreshed, refocused, and then watch them go again back into the field um, prayerfully. Some, some end up leaving ministry as they consider what the Lord is calling to them next, uh, but so many of them have the chance to stay in ministry and just change um, maybe a, to a different city or a different team or a different focus for their ministry. So um, I want to personally, my wife and I want to personally thank you all for partnering with us in that. We believe that without the prayers of the individuals that partner with, with us and the three churches that partner with us, that our, that our ministry wouldn't happen. It wouldn't be effective. It wouldn't be fruitful. Um, and so you, um, Green Road Church, have been a faithful partner to us uh, for many years now. And we believe what God does in and through your prayers and your financial support is that it, Im it impacts lives like Garrett and Laura as um, they came in to be a part of that program and then are sent back out. Um, we believe that fruit is, comes from your prayers and your financial support. Um, as we continue to trust God to uh, lead us in effective ministry. So, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, another two, thing, two other practical ways that we lead. Um, I get to serve on a core team of four people that gives overall leadership to this program and helps to design um, year to year what the program looks like. Um, and also help to care for our staff team that helps lead the program. And then um, Renee actually will be able to jump in a little bit more this year because our youngest, believe it or not, is in preschool this coming year for a couple days a week. And so Renee is gonna jump back in and she's been um, co-leading the small group with me, um, but this, this year she'll be serving more with our retreats. So we have four retreats throughout the year where we provide um, opportunities, again, for the staff that are part of the program to get outside of Orlando a little bit. Um, usually, or that happens at the beginning of the year, one at the end of the year to reflect on what God has done, and then two in the middle of the year, a, a men's retreat and a women's retreat. And so Renee will be helping just coordinate all four of those retreats. And that is where she loves to serve. Um, I got to see that again um, yesterday for my dad's retirement party. Um, she did all the decor for the event and organized what, what the atmosphere looked like. That is her bread and butter. She loves to do that. The Lord has gifted her tremendously, so I'm excited to see her serve in that capacity this coming year again. So that's a little bit about what we do and what we trust God for. Um, here's a, just a few quick um, snapshots from some participants that have gone through the program. One participant... Um, said this, it's been a great year of processing and digging deeper into my story as well as a great community for both adults and kids. So we offer, offer an aspect for our missionary kids as well where we're pouring into them um, and helping them in the transition because it's not just the parents, the missionary parents that are transitioning, but it's also the kids as well. So we offer care for them. 
Um, another uh, missionary said this, this year has been an oasis for me and my family. We've been refreshed. We've experienced growth. Thank you to the staff for all the work that you've put into everything this year. Um, and the last person, one other person said this, this has been a wonderful year. We are so grateful for this season and the generous provision of time and support to be able to process the ministry that we've walked through. So those, again, I, I attribute those to the Lord and all, all glory and praise goes to him, but he uses your prayers and your partnership to create an, an atmosphere in Orlando where we can serve these missionaries um, and trust that the Lord would send them out to the next place in their journey. Um, so lastly, I'll just wrap up with just a few prayer requests. Uh, I apologize, this was all supposed to be on the screen. Ellen reminded me that I was supposed to send the PowerPoint to my brother Tom. I forgot to do that. So just imagine a wonderful, beautiful PowerPoint with this up there, if you can. Um, so uh, yeah, four quick prayer requests. Um, from here, we actually travel, uh, well, first to Minnesota to visit a relative, but then over to Milwaukee. Um, crew has a biennial, usually, this, this year actually be after three years because of COVID, um, a biennial conference for all of the U.S. staff. So there'll be 6,000 of us gathering in Milwaukee. And um, these are the 6,000 staff that serve some internationally, uh, a lot around the states, some in Orlando at the headquarters. But we'll gather together for an opportunity to hear from some teachers um, in the word, uh, some of our leadership, and it's just an opportunity for us to be um, refocused on the Lord and for us to continue to, to build into the community of crew as well and to be um, trained and developed for uh, what we do as missionaries. So um, pray for this. This will be our next location. Brief stop in Minnesota will be our third stop. Our fourth stop will be Milwaukee. And it's a lot to ask of our kids to do that in one month. It's a whirlwind. Our son has been asking when we get to go home um, for the last week. And um, so it's just a lot to ask. Would you, would you pray for our family as we travel um, that we just be able to have good connection time together? Uh, my mother-in-law is actually joining us in Milwaukee and she'll care for our kids while we attend the conference. So we're grateful for that. Um, and then just for refreshment for us in, the, in our relationship with Jesus and um, with our fellow crew staff. Um, and pray for, pray for our health, that the Lord would protect us. Um, you know, the reason why we haven't gathered is because of the impact of COVID, and COVID is still here. In gathering 6,000 people, there's, there's risk there, and um, we understand that, and there's uh, some protocol in place, but yet things will happen, and we just want to trust the Lord with that, at the same time, we just ask that you pray that the Lord would strengthen all of us and that, um, uh, you know, we would all, the all 6,000 of us would be able to participate fully in the conference and not have to step away and isolate or um, have to leave the conference because of COVID. And then um, finally, would you pray for the 35 um, new staff, or pardon me, staff new to us that are coming in for the program this year. Um, so we have a mixture again of staff that have served overseas, staff that have served around the U.S. Um, we have a mixture of um, people who have been in ministry for over 30 years plus to people who have been in ministry for seven, eight years. A um, lot of singles this year. This will be the largest group of singles that we've ever had go through the program. I think we have 18 singles coming this year um, and then a number of married couples as well with kids. Um, would you pray for them there? They'll be leaving the staff conference and then moving to Orlando for the next year. And that's a huge transition for them. So you can pray for that. And you can pray for our team that we'd be ready to welcome them and that we'd be prepared for another 10 months of investing in these missionaries. Um, so, and, and um, again, we always ask this, but we ask that you, you pray for our marriage. Um, first, pray that, that we would continue to walk closely with Jesus. And then pray for our marriage that the Lord would strengthen that um, and pray for our family um, because all three of those are um, way more important than the ministry that we actually do. So 
pray for those things first and foremost. So um, I guess I threw in a fifth one there, didn't I? I apologize for that, but yeah, there you go. Um, thank you again for uh, all that you do in this partnership and the ways that you have cared for us deeply, the ways that you minister to us every time we come here, um, and the ways that individuals in this church have ministered to me, my, my family growing up, and now um, my, my family um, that we have now. So um, thank you so much. I hand this to you. I was asked to give the blessing, but I think that we've heard some prayer requests. And uh, Doug and Renee, we're so glad that you're involved in this ministry. And you're in the front lines, helping people grow so they can be in the front lines to be able to bring the word. We're always told that people need Jesus. And that's really so true. I'd like to try to catch up a couple of these prayer requests and pray for you, okay? Yes, I'm not going to promise that I remember everything. Okay. <laughs> Father God, we just want to come and pray for Doug and Renee, for their family. And we think of them specifically as they're doing all this traveling right now. We just ask that you'd watch over every single one of them. We pray that you give them safety in their travels. We pray for health and strength because we know, like he mentioned, COVID is still prevalent and all kinds of other respiratory types of things. So we'd like to pray for your hand of blessing upon them and keep them healthy and keep them well during this time. We'd ask that you'd walk with them. We pray, Lord, that the various people that they meet, that these would be good times. We also pray as they've really given so much of themselves over the past years, that this would be a time of refreshment, a time of encouragement, a time of learning, a time of being able to see things from a different perspective and being able to say, Lord, how do you want us to minister in this next year? We pray, Lord, too, that you would just uh, be with these 35 new staff people and families that are coming in. Uh, they're going to be making a big change. We pray, Lord, you may at this time be already working and protecting them and also working in their hearts and in their lives so they could be receptive to what you have for them, perhaps in the next step in their life, whatever it might be. We just ask for your guidance. We pray for your leading. We pray for the children. They're moving around all over the place. It gets tiring. The son has said, when are we going to go home, mom and dad? We would just pray that you would just walk with them Give them times of refreshment. People that come around, just be an encouragement to them. Uh, things that they could see which would be different and give them new experiences and things just to really open up their hearts and lives as well. And so God, we just come before you today and we pray for all these many things that are taking place. We pray for Doug and Renee. We pray for their relationship with you that it may continue to grow stronger and fresher. And uh, we pray for their marriage that it may grow stronger as well that they might be able to look at each other and be able to say, I'm so glad I married you. I'm so glad we're in it together. And I want to go with you through the long journey. And we pray, Lord, for these children, that they may become part of this family. They may be working together as a whole, and people may be able to see Jesus Christ and just how the whole family works. God, I've missed some things, but that's okay. You've heard these. You've heard Doug's requests. You've listened to them, and you can deal with them much better than I can. And so we just give you thanks that we can bring these cares and concerns to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for the parting blessing. My friends, go in peace and may the grace of Christ our Savior, the love of God the Father, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with and surround you always. Amen.